Welcome back. <laughs> the psalmist wrote, oh, how good it is. In fact, oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. As I think about that passage of Scripture, the word pleasant describes the man that's in our text today. In fact, his name means pleasant. And uh, as I studied, I, I looked up that word pleasant, and I also found that the word pleasant was the surname of the first black woman millionaire. She was born in Philadelphia, and back then, uh, when, when, and, and she was a free person, because up in Philly, they were free up around there, and, and also uh, uh, Nantucket, um, where she eventually uh, ended up. But uh, parents would have kids back then, and uh, they didn't want, they didn't have a lot to kind of raise their kids, so they would allow their kids to be servants for some of the wealthy families, and this was her case, and so she was a servant. Her name is Mary Ellen Pleasant. And what's surprising to me, and really a pleasant surprise, was the fact that she moved from Nantucket, and then she went all the way to California, and in California she built up a reputation for uh, being such a civil rights advocate that they gave her a special Commentation. In fact, she was known in that area as the, the person civil, who, who made a, a dent in civil rights in California, and they came up with some laws as a result of her. Now, here's what she did. In California and also in Nantucket, she was a, a servant for the wealthy families, and so when she went to California, she was also a servant for the wealthy families. Now, while she was there, she was making $500 a month. And back in the 1800s, that's a lot of money. So she's making $500 a month, and she's hearing at the table these businessmen talking about what stocks to buy, and she's also hearing how to become a good business person. So over the years, she teamed up with a man named Bell who worked at a bank, and he, he, he knew all about the banking system. And so they kind of teamed up clandestinely, and so they started to buy laundries, and they, would, they, 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 they bought a, a fleet of laundry, built buildings and things with, with laundries, and, and they also bought stock in Wells Fargo. They bought stock in other banks in California specifically, and she amassed back then $30 million. Now, 30, she, she came to California with $15 million. Now, for her to amass over $30 million, that would be close to a billion dollars in our dollars today. Now, she, her name was Pleasant. That was her surname because she had gotten married to a man named John Pleasant and uh, John James Pleasant. And, and, and so, as a result, her first husband, by the way, named Bell, he died. But he was also wealthy. He was, he was mixed race, and, uh, and so he left her uh, some money, and that's how come she had $15 million and she traveled. Now, she helped the, the slaves on the ground, railroad and all that with her money, and she was also a believer. Now, her name means pleasant, but the end of her, of her life was anything but pleasant because she couldn't put anything in her name being a slave or being a minority back then, Bell allowed her to put everything in his name, surname, with her first name. But when he died, 
His wife would not allow her to have any of the money. She was living in a home that that cost her $150 million to build, and today it would be $2.5 million. And she lived in that home because his wife didn't take it from her, but she couldn't keep it up. And so she died after having all that money poor and broke. Her death was unpleasant. Her death was offensive. Her death was repulsive. Like a man's life who lived with leprosy. His life, his name means pleasant, but his life was anything but pleasant. But he had a servant (laughs) who gave him spiritual advice to help him deal with his leprosy. Now, you got to, you understand, you got a servant over here who's who's, who's living among wealthy people, And then you've got a servant girl who's a slave girl who's been captured. She's an Israelite, and she's living among folks who are wealthy, but she has a wealth of wisdom, and she gives it, God bless you, she gives it to her master. Well, why would she do that? And my wife and I were talking about this, and and she said, you know, honey, I believe that because the way she was treated as a servant girl in his house, that's the reason why she wanted to help him. And I said, you know what? You're right. She's telling it to me from her vantage point, and it made sense to me. And so she goes, she is this guy's (laughs) wife's personal servant. And she tells his wife something that would help him out physically, and it would eventually help him out spiritually, and he would get rid of his leprosy. Her advice was worth <laughs> weight in gold. It's weight in gold. She was, she was a millionaire because of the gold rush. She bought a, lot, she bought a gold mine and silver mines, and, and she was making money hand over fist. And so here is this slave girl who doesn't have that means but she does have a connection with the God who has everything. And so God gives her some favor and some wisdom. And so my message today, we're going to be looking at this particular man's miraculous or marvelous character, by the way, and his miserable condition and his miraculous cure. And as we look at it, I I want to tell you a little bit about leprosy because you need to understand, according to Jewish law, leprosy was a sin, and it was something that you didn't want to have. A leper had a societal, had to distance themselves from society, and they had to practice, get this, social distancing because of their leprosy. Now, you know, during COVID, it, it divided us. I mean, because people were telling us to do stuff, and it divided us. They told us, you better wear this mask. You better wear this. You better get it. You, you better, you got to, you got to, you got to. And, and if you didn't do what they said you got to do, then people looked at you like you were walking around with leprosy. Oh, you don't have a mask? You, oh, oh, you, you know, they, they treat you like you had COVID because you didn't wear a mask. And to be a leper, a leper had a, a societal, uh, uh, had, to, had to socially distance from people about six feet away from other people. Hmm, does that sound familiar? And they couldn't even get this. They couldn't even be close to their family members. Now, can you imagine a wife not being able? Six feet? Hey, honey. How you doing? How you doing today? 
Can't hug her, can't kiss her. I mean, ah, I'm sorry, I got leprosy. What a house that would have been. Mm, but God is going to step in and do something miraculous. They had to cry out if they had leprosy. Unclean! They had to say it twice so that people would, would socially distance from them because of their leprosy. Now, to be saved, we must confess our uncleanness, kind of like having leprosy. And as we confess our sins, then receive Jesus Christ, then because of his sacrifice on the cross and because of his blood sacrifice, we can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Now, we've, when we understand the, the seriousness of sin, we too will cry out unclean, like the leper. Or like, uh, remember Isaiah in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 6, when he was uh, in a holy place and he cried out, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among people of the same. And if we cry out like Isaiah and like uh, this leper, then we too will be clean and we too will understand what God can do because the angel came down and touched Isaiah's tongue uh, with some burning coals and he was cleansed. It's totally different in our story. Let's look at the leper's marvelous character in 2 Kings and let's just see some things about him. It says, now Naaman was commander of the army, great position, of the king of Aram. He was a great man. So he's a commander and he's a great man in the sight of his master. Now that's something. He's a, he was a great man in the sight of his master. How many of us are looked upon that way by our employers? How many of our employers would say of us to other people, you know something? Oh, Joe is a great man. Oh, James is a great man among our employees. Can you imagine hearing other people hear your employer say that about you? In the sight of his master, and he was highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but conjunction of contrast, he had leprosy. Now, whenever there's a but at the end of praise, it kind of almost negates everything that came before it because of the but. But the leprosy seemed to be that little black dot on a white piece of paper that all you see, you got a, it's like having a, a giant chalkboard and all white. And then you go up and you take a marker and you just put one little small dot in the corner that's black or red. And what do you see amongst all the white? Where does your eye go? To the dot. So even though he's a commander, even though he's highly regarded, where do you go? To the dot. What's the dot? Leprosy. What's the dot in your life? Oh, there's a but. You may not admit it, but if you talk to some of your friends, they can say, yeah, well, you're all right, but. Huh? Huh? And if you say you don't have a but in your life, Ask some friends. Talk to them long enough. They'll have some butts for you. You know, you know, you are you a good friend, but when I need you know, you were a great friend, but when I need but when I ask but when, I mean you we all have if we didn't we'd be perfect. And we're not perfect. Can you imagine having a very successful career? degrees, 
trophies, plaques on the wall, all of those things that you've accomplished in life, but then there's that but. But you didn't win the race when you were in college as an athlete. But you didn't win the championship. There are a lot of players who played in the Super Bowl, but they don't have a Super Bowl ring. They played and they played and they played and they tried to get the ring, but and for a lot of them, it don't mean a thing. Kind of like a woman who's dating a guy, don't mean a thing unless I got the ring. <laughs> and there are a lot of players right now who, are, who play sports and they have no ring and they should have had a championship ring but they don't have a ring in Matthew chapter 8 and verses 2 to 3 a man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and he said Lord if you are willing you can make me clean. And Jesus reached down, and he touched him, and he said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. And you know, if you're willing to admit that there's a but in your life, and you go to Jesus like the leper, and you say to Jesus, Jesus, if you are willing, I can be clean. And God will reach out to you the same as he did to the leper. And he says, I am willing, be saved in the name of Jesus. I am willing, be cleansed in the name of Jesus. God never turns anyone away. He says, you know, whosoever will, let him come. In fact, he gives us an invitation. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's an invitation for salvation. Then he says, take my yoke upon you after you are born again. And then he says, and you will find rest for your souls. So he gives it to the ones who are unsaved, and those who are, who are saved, we find it. And we, fi we find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Naaman's story, unfortunately, isn't as cut and dried as the one who went to Jesus. But God's going to use an unnamed, an unimportant, and seemingly unexpected servant who happens to have a connection with Almighty God and who has faith in his ability to heal and his power to heal. And so he tells the master's wife about it. Let's look at his miserable condition. In verse 2 of chapter 5, it says, Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, now she must have had a great relationship with her to even go to her and talk to her about her husband. If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria. So apparently, a conversation had, had ensued. Because this doesn't seem to me to be a beginning of a conversation. It seems to me that there was some, something going on in the house, and she comes to a mistress, and, and she says this to her, to, to give her uh, some sort of, uh, uh, I, I guess, a clue uh, to, to how to get the problem solved. She says, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria... He would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master. Now, he went to his master because his wife told him what her servant told her. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him. 700 pounds of silver, 100 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. Dude's got it good. He's planning on staying at least a few days. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Watch what happens. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he ripped his robe and said, Am I God? 
Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? So what two things does, does he confess about God? Well, these three. First, he says, am I God? So he must recognize that there is someone greater than himself. And then he recognizes that whoever dies, God is the one who has life and death, the power of it in his hands. And then he talks about, can I raise from the people from the dead? So he believes that there is a resurrection. Now, some people in the New Testament didn't believe that. But this guy in the Old Testament believes that God is God, God kills, and God can raise from the dead when you die. See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? So he's thinking he's being set up. But he's not being set up for this. But he's going to be set up for something else more spectacular than this. So the king, is he's ripped his, his robe and I believe he's feeling a sense of anxiety and distress because he knew God kills, he knew God raises from the dead, but he knows that he doesn't have the power to do anything with leprosy, and he can't heal anything. Verse 8, when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message, uh, King, why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me. He will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a message to say to him, Oh, wait a minute. Oh, hey, wait a minute. This is a commander. He is highly regarded by his master. He's coming with a whole bunch of silver and a whole bunch of gold and a whole bunch of men. And Elijah the prophet sends a messenger out to him. He doesn't personally go out to see him. Can you imagine somebody coming over to your house wanting to see you? And if you have it like that, you can send out your servant. Say, go on out there and take care of that for me. And I'm sure they'd be going in, you know, at the front door. Do what? <laughs> Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, must not have been all over his body, and cure me from my leprosy or of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the Muddy waters of Israel, that's what they were known for. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Why? Because things didn't go the way he perceived them to go. He had in his mind, this is how things are going to happen. I am commander. I am highly regarded. You know, I've, I've been in battles. I've won wars. And I am highly regarded by my king and, and my, my master. So surely this man knows about me. <laughs> Don't we do the same thing? As soon as we get a little bit of a position somewhere, we start thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. Now, you don't have to confess, but I will. You know, I remember I, at the age of 17, I was the youngest program director in the country because I understood programming. And everybody knew that I understood it. I had a reputation up in Baltimore about how I programmed and, and how I picked songs and stuff. And at 17, I was just, just too smug. I'm 17 years old. 
I'm thinking, man, I'm in charge of these adults. I was the manager of adults at 17, and I strutted around like a peacock. Yeah. <laughs> Until one day, somebody that had higher rank than me said, you fired. <laughs> now, I don't know what your story is, but I know you got one. But, I, you know, we, 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 we won't have, uh, you know, a time for you to, to, to get up and confess about it because you probably won't even tell on yourself. But uh, God is telling you, you remember w- w- what you did, don't you? So Elijah prescribes the Jordan River, not a river in Damascus. Let me tell you something. Our faith in the ridiculous becomes miraculous when we obey God beyond the boundaries of our belief. That, that's, my wife and I were talking about that this morning. We, we went to, I, I took her to Exodus and, and 23, and, and that's where uh, God showed me that he, he had a land prepared for us, uh, and it was prepared in, in more ways than, 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 than you'd really know. I mean, everything was here. All we had to do was tap into the plumbing, tap into the sewer system, well, the electrical system, I mean, EPB poles all around because this whole area was supposed to be a subdivision. So they'd already prepped the land. And so I didn't know that this was the land until Frankie, praise God, she turned us on to this realtor. I had her to go and uh, Frankie Bass went and she was, she was our mediator. And, you know, first time uh, he, he turned her down, turned us down. And the uh, second time he went back, she went back and he said, Pastor, he's gone down $100,000 from 250. I said, okay, I think we can work with that. But, you know, I, I read through that verse of Scripture, and God was telling me he had a place prepared, but it was land. He had land prepared for us. And I thought it was a place, but it was land, land. I said, boy, land. Can you read? Land. And, 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 so, and so, you know, we, we got here, and I, I didn't have enough money to because no bank had given us the money that we needed. We just had enough money to pay off the land. But the women, Frankie Bass, my wife, and other women, they, they, they came over here one day, and they were praying for God to move mightily. And they were praying beyond, you know, our resources. And more miraculous things happened. The day that they were prepping the land, clouds came over, and rain was pouring down on Moore Road and parts of a, a Brainerd Road. But it stopped. Hear what I'm saying? The rain stopped by Brainerd High School. It didn't come all the way up this way. So that's what I said. Mm. <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm trying to tell you what happens when people pray and you believe beyond the boundaries of your belief. Yeah. I believe that God was going to provide the resources because he said he had a land prepared for us. And I wasn't, I wasn't getting off of that promise. I was standing on it until I die. I said, God, it's in your hands. And you know what God did? He came through. Y'all sitting in it. Y'all come in here every Sunday. Y'all sitting on a miracle. Amen. This is a miracle. This is what God did for us. That's what Moses was trying to tell the children of Israel. He said, look, this land is not yours. It belongs to God. He gave this land to us. And the only reason why it's in the mess that it's in now it's because Joshua and all those folks that were supposed to drive out the enemies out of the promised land didn't do what they said, didn't do what God told them to do. And so now they're having to deal with it. But, you know, it's, it's all in God's hands, and, and God's going to take care because we don't own nothing. This land belongs to God. You may have a title deed, but God, you know, he can wipe it out with, 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 a, with a thunderstorm, you know, and a tornado. He's oh, you think this is yours? <laughs> it's gone. What you got now? Nothing. You know, there's some people right now that can't rebuild after we had that tornado here in our, in our area. They haven't rebuilt yet. Some of them, insurance, whatever, you know. I mean, so, look, but if you have a promise from God, he can perform a miracle with, a, with faith. And he performed a miracle in our life and in our church because people dared to pray. Elijah was not awed by Naaman's power, nor moved by his pouting. And here's what I understand when it comes to miracles. 
God uses unexpected people to help. God uses unexpected power to heal. God uses unexpected places, uh, whether unaccepted places, so he can humble us. See, sometimes when, when, when we don't want to do something it's because it's not acceptable to us, you know what God will do? He'll put you in a situation where he'll have to humble you under his mighty hand so that he can exalt you at the proper time, and he will tell you, you know, this is the proper time now. I'm going to exalt you. Uh, you, you you've been walking around pouting, uh, but, uh, but now you're ready for me to bless you. So Naaman thought more highly of himself than he ought. He's telling Elijah that Damascus is superior and the Jordan is inferior. Now, how can you tell what God has chosen is inferior? I mean, that's just ridiculous to me. In the Old Testament, let me give you a little back, uh, back story here. In the Old Testament, when a leper came to be cleansed, they took the blood of the sacrifice and applied it to his right ear, to his left toe, and also, I mean, to his right ear, to his right thumb, and also to his right foot. And that meant judicially the sin debt had been paid by the sacrifice and the blood. <laughs> After the blood was applied, the leper was to go and be washed in water. So let's look at what happens next, the miraculous cure. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? What are they doing? They're appealing to his pride. Well, yeah, I would have done it because, you know, I'm a commander. I'm highly regarded. I would have done it. How much more then? When he tells you, wash and be cleansed, which is really a small thing. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. Well, no, no, let me just go back. The little boy, the, his skin became like a little boy, but he just had a small spot on his body. But because when God healed the little small spot, he just went on and healed the whole body. Y'all ahead of me. He probably went back home, wife went, Whoa, what have I got here? Where you been? How you looking like that? You know, you look years younger. Where did you go? I was at the Jordan River. The Jordan River did that? You mean that muddy river? You came out looking like that? Yeah, I'm going to give me a mud bath. <laughs> <laughs> the name and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now, watch this, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Oh, now you are Elijah's servant? Oh, yeah. He's humbled himself, hasn't he? The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to, it, to any other God, but the Lord. What's happened? This man has been converted. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. What's that? When my master enters the temple of Remen to bow down 
and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple in Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. In other words, he realized by bribing him or trying to bribe him, he had just committed a sin. You don't bribe a prophet. A prophet doesn't do prophecies for money. At least the real ones don't. I mean, you know, you can, uh, I, I, I mean, you, you know, people, I have buried a lot of people. I have married a lot of people, and I never ask for a dime. There are a lot of Pastors that will tell you, you know, well, okay, I'll marry you, but it's going to cost you this. I don't, I don't charge anything. Not to you know, toot my own horn, but I just want to let you know, there's things that I just feel it is part of my duty, part of my job as pastor to take care of those things. You shouldn't, if, if I've got to do a funeral, you shouldn't have to worry about spending any money to pay me to, to preach I mean, I'm your pastor. I ought, to, I ought to be doing, I ought to pay you to preach. I ought to pay you to let me preach, rather. You know, I say, here, here's some money. Can I, can I do this? You know what I mean? That, that's just how I think about it. So he says, go in peace, Elijah said. So Naaman started home again. Boy. Verse 13 shows us his heart was convicted. So he repents. In verse 14, Going down into the Jordan seven times is a picture of, really, of his reliance on God's way of restoration. Seven is the number for completion and perfection. We are all saved completely through repentance. We're all saved judiciously by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we're all saved the same way. And so Naaman was renewed. We too are renewed. And as soon as we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. So Naaman, what he says is, Naaman's healing was the complete work of God, not their God, Baal. Baal was the one that was supposed to do healing, but he couldn't heal Naaman. Only Elijah's God could. So Naaman's miraculous physical healing changed him spiritually and physically. Now, when Naaman tried to reward Elijah, he refused to accept. And Naaman was so convicted that he vowed to seek God's forgiveness when he worshiped the Lord in his temple. And that's, that's okay with me. Unfortunately, after his miraculous cure... There was a, well, there was a miraculous cure, but then there was a, a moral calamity after his miraculous cure. Let me show you that in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 20. It says, but Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said to himself, my master should not have let this Aramean get away without accepting any of his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running behind him, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. Yes, Gehazi said. Uh, but my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give to them. By all means, take twice as much silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up money in two bags, and sent two of his own personal servants to carry the gifts for Gehazi. <laughs> but when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from the servant and sent the men back. Then he went and hid the gifts inside the house. When he went in to his master, Elijah asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? 
I haven't been anywhere. It's kind of like the, you, you ask a kid, did you, did, did you, did you go, did, did you open that? Open what? <laughs> did you eat the cookies? Why cookies? But Elijah asked him, don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Mm-hmm. Is this the time to receive money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle and male and female servants? Because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. He covered with leprosy, not a spot covered with leprosy. His skin was white as snow and his hair as well. Now, when Miriam and Aaron, y'all remember the story in Numbers chapter 12 when um, well, Abraham, it was Moses, Moses, uh, was it Moses, Abraham, I'm going to get these people mixed up. Moses married an, uh, uh, an, uh, an Ethiopian and Miriam and Aaron took issue with it. And God didn't like it. So God struck Miriam with leprosy. Moses tried to pray and get it removed. And he said, no. But she will be separated from everybody for seven days. Now, what are they telling us to do if you get COVID now? Stay home, isolate for how long? Five days. Then you can go back out. Well, they ate seven days to get leprosy. But where did they get this notion of five days? I believe it's all biblical. That's just my, my, my opinion. I mean, I just think it's all biblical. I mean, man doesn't come up with nothing on their own. I mean, anything we come up with, it's already, God has already, you know, he's the one that's already done it. And, and he knows about everything. And so he gives wisdom to those people that he wants to give wisdom to. Now, Gehazi, his name means goggled-eyed and valley of vision. Now, I don't know what that looked like to have goggled eyes. <laughs> I just, you know, yeah, I, I can just, I can just, a cartoonish kind of thing, goggled-eyed, and valley of vision is the other name that uh, his, his other definition for his name. But his greed blinded his goggled eyes. It caused a moral calamity, and he because he questioned Elijah's wisdom. How are you going to question the man of God's wisdom and you his servant? Naaman's story begins with his marvelous character and his miserable condition, but it ended with a miraculous cure because of his faith. Speaking of faith, our faith. This is my sticky note. God's healing power isn't limited by the severity of our condition but by the sincerity of our submission. Our face in the ridiculous becomes miraculous when we obey God beyond the boundaries of our belief. God used the faith of Naaman and his slave, who wasn't a person of power, but <laughs> she knew a person who had all the power and she knew that he could heal diseases. She had influence with his wife. And so she reminds him, or she reminds me rather, of, of, of this proverb. This proverb says this in Proverbs 30. It says, four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. It says that, that are found in king's palaces. And I thought about this slave girl. 
She is from Israel, but she's an insider, kind of like a small spider weaving her web of wisdom inside the king's palace because that's where Naaman stayed. He was right there. He was the, the king's commander. And so he was there taking care of the palace, the guarded. Now, as a servant of God, who can you point to God who needs physical, spiritual, or mental healing? Who is it that needs emotional healing in your orbit? God heals our broken bodies. God heals our broken hearts. God heals broken relationships. But you got to go to him. There are some things that are broke that can't nobody fix but God. You know for yourself, you've been trying to fix something, and it can't be fixed by you. And so you finally gave up, and you asked God. Now look, God is the only one that heals. But don't expect God to do things your way. Don't tell God how to perform your miracle. God is the one that understands how to perform miracles. You know, we just insult him when we come to him and say, now, God, here is what I want. I want to, and I want to, and I want to, and, and I want to, and I. You need to step back and say, well, wait a minute. God, what do you want from me? Because I'm your servant. Now, what do you want me to do, and how can you use me to, to, look, to do your will and not my will? Because Jesus said, I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of the Father. Now, Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Who are we to tell the Father to do our will? I mean, we got it twisted. We need to get things untangled. We go to God and pray, God, I have a need, and I'm laying my need down before you. And however you want to take care of it, thank you. Now, this is what I'm thinking. (laughs) But now, you know me, I'm so fickle. I may think this way today and tomorrow I may not want that. So I want you to give me whatever is best for me. Naaman's act of washing in the Jordan River was a preparation for his holy healing and restoration. What do you need God to heal in your life? God's healing power is not limited by the severity of our condition, but by the sincerity of our submission. If you sincerely go to God and humble yourself before him, you will see whatever is severe in your life be handled under the mighty, powerful hand of God. Naaman's submission was a pleasant surprise, pun intended. He went into the Jordan River as an old leper, but he came out of the river, river a new lifer. You and I came out with a new life in Christ Jesus. Naaman's healing would have a ripple effect touching the lives of everybody around him. Remember now, he's a Syrian. He lives in Syria. That's that's miraculous because the the, the Jews didn't have anything to do with the Syrians. They're surrounded by all of these different kinds of people. But God uses the least, the last, and the lost to bring people into his kingdom. He can use a sinner to bring somebody to him if he wants to. Look, if he made a donkey speak to a prophet to get his attention, can he use a sinful person to give you a verse of Scripture? He could be using it just to tease you. And don't realize that that verse that he's teasing you with is what you really need to get saved. (laughs) You know, God can do some things, you know, that beyond our understanding. But God used a slave girl. Naaman was lost, but God used a slave girl to point him to the God who heals all of our diseases. Elijah's God would become his God. Jesus remembered this story in Luke chapter 4, and I'm going to make some, I'm going to explain something to you here, and then we're going to close out. It says, And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. 
All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. What? You mean God didn't heal a Jew? No. He healed a Syrian. They got up, drove out Jesus out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Now, can you imagine, there's a crowd of people all around him from the synagogue. From the synagogue. He's over at the end of the cliff. They're about ready to push him over. But Jesus turns around and walks through him. <laughs> Nobody stops him because everybody is frozen in their steps. They don't do nothing. They can't do nothing. Why? Because it's God and it wasn't his time yet. You can't kill God till it's time. And it wasn't his time. Hallelujah. Folks, there's some people that want to throw you over the cliff and you walk by them every day and they can't lay a finger on you. You know why? Not your time yet. <laughs> there's some folks that wish you'd get fired, but it's not your time yet. There's some folks that wish you'd lose your job, but it's not time yet. There's some people that hope and pray that you get sick but you still well. It ain't time yet. Look, you can't lay a hand on God's child until God says, okay, it's all right. That's what I know about my God. Elijah and Israelite gave instructions to Naaman, a Syrian, an enemy of Israel, how to be healed of his leprosy. Oh, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Leprosy was a social stigma, like some in our society who are ostracized and treated like lepers because of what they do and how they believe and all of that. And my Bible says, Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And the word brother here means those who are living around one another. All right. All right. That's good, Doc. Those in society, man, I, 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 it breaks my heart when I see how people treat one another. You know, they dig a ditch for people. But my Bible says, you better be careful when you dig a ditch. Because if you dig one, you better dig two because the ditch you've dug, you're going to fall into. Be careful. You may walk on somebody, and the next day that somebody is over top you, and now you're at their mercy looking for a job. And you go, oh, they the, they my, what? I got an interview with them? And you start remembering several years before how you treated them. And then I love what Martin Luther King said. He said, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Naaman didn't just sit back and wait for a miracle to happen. He took the initiative. He obeyed the instructions given to him by Elijah and he did what Elijah told him to do. When Elijah told him to jump in there, he did exactly that. It first came from the slave, the slave girl. She told him how to be healed. And his wife told him what she said. Then Elijah told him what he needed to do. And he dipped himself in the Jordan River, even though he felt the Jordan River was inferior to all the rivers in Damascus. It was in the act of doing and obeying, that he got healing. And that's how we all get healing. When God tells us something, we obey it. And then in our doing, things are taken care of. We too must take the initiative. There are some people in your orbit, some people around you that want to know Jesus, but you give them the, uh, the, the, the Jesus of the law. They want the God of grace. And, th and this is what I want to leave you with. God's great things are his grace things. Folks, 
When you want to get somebody saved, start with grace. Because that's how you were saved. It's by grace you're saved. Through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God. So that no one should boast. See, if you can boast, you can say, I, you know, I got saved because I bought God 700 pounds of gold and 150 pounds of silver, and I paid my way into heaven. Well, that's great, but it's not in the Bible. You're not saved by great things. You're saved by grace things. It's God that saves you by his grace and nothing else and mercy thrown in there because he knows you need mercy. It's in his doing and in your obeying that you are born again. So we too must take the initiative. There's somebody around you that needs grace. Who is it? Because they're going to die without knowing about God's grace and his mercy. Elijah refused Naaman's reward for service. So I'm going to ask you, what can you do this week as an act of service without just volunteering, without asking for a dime? You know what I love about our church? And, I, and, I, and I be, I'm be honest with you about some stuff. Um, and I know I've told you, but I haven't told you enough. But, you know, a lot of y'all, y'all just step up to the plate. I don't have to. You know, a lot of pastors, they go by and say, okay, uh, can, can you do this? Can you do this? There's so much stuff that goes on here. I don't even have to tell anybody to do it. It's done. Because there's always somebody saying, they, they see a need and they do it. They jump in there. They see a, they need to, people need to volunteer in an area. You volunteer. And, and you know, you, you look for ways to, to jump in. And I appreciate you for that. Because I don't never have to beg. Jesus didn't beg for disciples. He said, come follow me. And y'all, when y'all hear about something, you know what you do? You jump in there. And I appreciate that for, because, you, you know, you know that you're doing it not for me, but you're doing it for God. And it's the Lord Jesus whom you serve, and he's going to reward you. And I, and I thank God for all of you, all of our volunteers. You volunteer in the praise team, those of you who volunteer you know, in every ministry in our church. I, I thank God for you because you put in a lot of time. And you, look, your, your, your work is not in vain in the Lord. Because you're doing it for him, and God is going to reward you. Your reward is going to be great because of your faith in him, and you do it by grace. That same grace in which you work is the same grace that will save you today. Would you stand where you are? 